engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hello there, it is Eric Erickson here, News 95.5, AM 750, WSB, and Atlanta's Evening News. You, you know, so I, I heard, and this is out there, and, and I don't mean to to um, cast aspersions or anything, but it, I, I need to set the record straight because I've heard a lot of reporters say this today, and it was in the newscast, that the Alabama abortion law, uh, would see women thrown in jail. And in fact, that's what people are saying, is that the Alabama abortion law, like the Georgia law they're claiming, would throw people in jail. Let me read you Section 5 of the legislation. Uh, just so you we're clear here, the Alabama law would go much further than the Georgia law. The Alabama law would flat out prohibit abortion in the state of uh, Alabama. The, the Let me read you the opening synopsis of the bill. This bill would make abortion and attempted abortion felony offenses, except in cases where abortion is necessary in order to prevent a serious health risk to the unborn child's mother. This child would provide that a woman who receives an abortion will not be held criminally culpable or civilly liable for receiving the abortion. Huh? Yeah. I mean, that that's the opening synopsis of the legislation. So I've seen it's been on CNN, MSNBC, and, and the like today, the New York Times and elsewhere, all saying that in Alabama, they're banning abortion and women would go to jail if they have an abortion. But that's not actually true. Let me read you Section 5 of the legislation. Quote, no woman upon whom an abortion is performed or attempted to be performed shall be criminally or civilly liable. That's actually in the law. That is is the wording in the law in Alabama. So uh, saying that a woman could go to jail, is it's actually this law specifically says no, no woman can. Now, it, it's amazing to me how the, the pro-abortion movement has been so easily able to get news organizations to report this as a report this lie as truth and we're seeing it in georgia as well and a number of you asked me if i would go do a a deep dive and explain the law and i learned something in doing this that i want to share with you because i did not know it ahead of time and it's interesting jen jordan uh the the abortion barbie of georgia in the state senate that everyone tried to to herald as some sort of paragon of virtue for wanting to uh, support the right of people to kill kids uh, is out saying Eric Erickson's wrong on this. He's wrong. He is, so, so this is widely circulated piece. I wrote today at the Resurgent. You can always go to the Resurgent uh, But this afternoon they're having to push back on it because their fundraising is all premised on the fact that women are going to go to jail in Georgia. And she's saying I'm a lawyer and I know how to read statutes. So I'm a lawyer too, or at least I used to practice law. Went to law school, practiced criminal law. I know how to read statutes. I know how to read legislation, and I know how to read case law. It's very interesting to me that in her pushback she's not citing any cases or any statutes she's claiming that people said stuff on the floor of the senate but she doesn't have the video you know all the stuff is videoed you would think if there was actually a supporter of this legislation on the floor saying yeah we want to round up women and throw them in jail they would be circulating the video but they're not they're just making claims with nothing to back it up i've actually got the cases i've got the statutes i've got the law and i want to share that with you here i did not know before beginning the research on this georgia has actually had a statute on the books since 1876 that prohibits the prosecution of a woman for the death of her unborn child. Did you know that? Because I did not. I did not know that. But in 1876, Georgia passed a law that prohibited the prosecution of a woman for the death of her unborn child for any reason. And that law has been on the books. We've had multiple constitutional revisions in the state of Georgia, but that law has carried over since 1876. And the fetal heartbeat legislation, House Bill 481, doesn't change that. Now, last night, Alyssa Milano went on social media and she said, the Georgia bill states that a woman can be investigated for miscarrying and that women who travel to another state to get an abortion can spend up to 10 years in prison. I've read House Bill 481. And that language is not in there. You don't have to take my word for it. You can read the legislation yourself. It, that That is simply not there. Now, there are some wild opinions out there say, well, actually, what, what this does is because it gives personhood to a child, it puts the child under the murder statute, not the feticide statute, except that's not true at all. 
because the personhood, the, the very first section of the Georgia Code defines what is a natural person for purposes of taking the census. And Georgia is now saying that a child in the womb, an unborn child, will be considered a natural person for purposes of the census. And do you know where the legislation gets the language of what an unborn child is? It gets it from this 1876 law that prohibits women from being prosecuted. I mean, think about that for a minute. We, we, we're being told all of this stuff. It's being circulated in the media, and it's simply not true. Okay, now, I, I want to mention a, a case to you. The case name is Hillman versus State. It's from 1998. So it's pre-existing case law in Georgia. It goes back to the 1990s. In this case, and my apologies if you, if you have a, a child, I, I will clean this up for you. Um, but it, it's the facts are somewhat tough. Uh, it was an 18-year-old pregnant mom. The dad was nowhere to be seen. She was in her eighth month. She was on the verge of giving birth. And she ultimately decided because of a change of, of fortune in her life, she did not want this child anymore. And instead of giving birth and letting the child be adopted, she decided to kill the child. And the way she killed her child was she shot herself in the stomach. And in shooting herself in the stomach, she killed her child. And prosecutors in Georgia knew there, there's a law in the books in Georgia, 16-5-80, uh, if you want to look it up for yourself. And it says that uh, this is the feticide law in Georgia, that an unborn child, which is a, a, um, a homo sapien in a uterus not yet born, that is a, an unborn child a homo sapien um, in a woman not yet born, that no woman with respect to her unborn child can be prosecuted for that child's death. That's what the law says. No woman can be prosecuted. And so what prosecutors in Georgia decided to do in this Hillman case in 1998 is there's a separate piece of legislation. One piece applies to the women who are pregnant, and the other piece of legislation, 16-12-141, applies to the people who perform abortions. And what Georgia, what this case decided in 1998, the Hillman versus State, see what the prosecutor decided to do is we're not going to prosecute this mother for the death of her child. We're going to prosecute this woman for acting as her own abortionist. And under Georgia law, an abortion can only be performed in certain ways uh, with through certain methodologies. And shooting someone in the stomach to kill the child is not a legally authorized way to perform an abortion. So we're going to pursue this woman as her own abortionist. And the Georgia Court of Appeals ruled ruled in 1998 in the Hillman versus State case that, let me read this to you, uh, the state's first criminal abortion statute was enacted in 1876. The statute has been repeatedly reenacted by the legislature in substantially the same form in construing subsequent amendments to that statute. Georgia's appellate courts have consistently ruled that the pregnant woman upon whom the abortion procedure was performed cannot be indicted for this offense. In other words, since 1876, Georgia has blanketly prohibited the prosecution of any woman for the death of her child in utero, and it's clear that they can't be prosecuted under this. In fact, the, the court in, in Hillman said that you can't prosecute a woman under 16-12-141 because that applies to abortion providers. It doesn't apply to the pregnant woman, and that if you did this— Quote, any woman who suffers a post-viability miscarriage could be subject to scrutiny regarding whether or not she intentionally acted to cause the miscarriage. Therefore, no woman can ever be prosecuted under either of these statutes for the death of their unborn child. That is what the Georgia Court of Appeals ruled. And here's the thing. House Bill 481 doesn't change that. See, House Bill 481 doesn't actually get rid of 16-5-80. That's the blanket prohibition on prosecuting women for abortion doesn't get rid of that. What it does do is it adds an affirmative defense to the other statute, 1612-141. Now, for those of you having trouble keeping up with this, 16580 says you can't prosecute a woman for an unborn child. 1612-141 says you can't prosecute an abortion provider for uh, providing an abortion. And it adds an affirmative defense there for the abortion provider. 
saying that if a woman seeks an abortion, saying that she has to have it for uh, her life, that you can't prosecute the abortion provider. If you take the woman's word for it that she's doing this because she's going to die otherwise, then you can't prosecute the abortion provider. It's an affirmative defense there. Now, what Jen Jordan and, and the abortion rights activists are saying is that, oh, oh, this changes the whole dynamic of the law now. Suddenly it applies to the women. No. You can read this for yourself. Folks, you don't have to be a lawyer to read the law, and it is a myth to think that you have to. we got a bunch of lawyers, pro-abortion lawyers, who are emotionally invested in, in the idea that you can't understand the law. You must let them tell you what it means. We have a bunch of people in the news industry who are listening to these pro-abortion lawyers mischaracterizing the law. You can read the law for yourself. You don't need me to do it for you. I've done the research for you. I'm reading it for you here. The point of this is that in order to change the existing law, you have to pass new laws that specifically change the old law. And House Bill 41, the fetal heartbeat legislation, doesn't change the old law. It does not get rid of the prohibition on prosecuting women whose unborn children die. It does not get rid of the Supreme Court rule or the Georgia Court of Appeals ruling in Georgia that this other legislation only applies to abortion providers. It doesn't change any of that. It doesn't do that. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that I've got the statutes on my side of the argument. I have the new law on the side of my argument, and I have the case law on the side of my argument. I have a case law that says one statute doesn't apply to women, and the other statute blanketly prohibits prosecuting of women. I've got the existing law that says women cannot be prosecuted for having an abortion in Georgia, and I've got the new law that doesn't change the old law. And so all of these people who are out there, Jen Jordan from the state Senate as well, say, oh, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. They can't cite where any of this changes. All they can do is scream hysterically and say, it changes, it changes, it changes. Show me. Well, we can't show you. Somebody said something on the floor of the Senate that said this is what they wanted. You know, if I got what I wanted, I would have billions of dollars and not be here behind the microphone, but I haven't gotten billions of dollars. I'm, I live in the real world, and in the real world, the law has not changed. No women can be prosecuted in Georgia for having an abortion. Today, tomorrow, next year, or last year, the law hasn't changed. Anyone who tells you otherwise is a damn liar. Just a quick pause to give you a word about one of our great sponsors this week is Harry's Razors. Their founders were tired of paying up for razors that were overpriced and overdesigned. They know that shaving, you know that shaving doesn't require all the gimmicks like vibrating heads and flexible balls and handles that look like spaceships and things like that. Tactics the leading brands use just to raise prices. Harry's founders went out, they bought their own factory in Germany that makes world-class steel blades. You get a great shave for them. I've been a user of theirs for a long time. Really, I've been a user of Harry's for a long time. And right now, you can get a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave by going to harrys.com slash Eric. You'll be joining 10 million others who've tried Harry's. You'll get a weighted ergonomic handle, a five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, a travel blade cover, and listeners of my show can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash Eric. That's harrys.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. So go to harrys.com slash Eric, redeem your offer, let them know I said you would help support the show, and you'll be getting a great shave in the process. You know, I tell my radio listeners as well, uh, as, as I'll tell you guys on the podcast, that I was always hesitant to use a five-blade razor because of razor burn, and I'm using Harry's five-blade razor, have been for a while now. They convinced me to switch from the three-blade to the five-blade, and it I don't get razor burn, so I like Harry's. You can go to harrys.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, today and get this great deal from Harry's. An important note from the uh, Agriculture Commissioner, Gary Black. Uh, In fact, I've seen this now in Atlanta at one of the hipster coffee joints I went to last week. Uh, People putting CBD oil in food and drinks. Uh, There's a place near my house that has advertised this as well, uh, putting uh, CBD oils derived from hemp in various products. Uh, The Agriculture Commissioner has pointed out that it actually is against federal law to do that. Please don't do that. Um, The FDA has not approved it. It's against federal law, and the state is probably going to have to begin cracking down on this. So don't do that, folks. You can buy CBD oil. But restaurants and and stores are not allowed to put it in your 
food and beverages for you. You have to do it yourself. Um, so pay attention to that. Also, uh, Jim Beck, I, I you know, I, <laughs> I wrote a wrote a thing earlier today, and, and uh, Glenn Beck got indicted. No, no, I, I had to. Well, I published this like, oh, beep. Um, had to change it. Uh, Jim Beck, the insurance commissioner, uh, he he has pled not guilty in federal court. He made himself available to the uh, federal authorities, uh, went to his arraignment, and has pled not guilty. Um, I am told uh, there are some people urging, prominent people urging the governor to convene a panel to see if he should be suspended from his role. This will, I'm sure, come to a head this weekend, as I mentioned yesterday. Uh, You've got the Republican convention in Savannah. I was thinking of going down there on Friday and doing the show, but there's so much other stuff going on as well, and I can't guarantee the quality of the connection back to the home office, so decided I'm probably not going to go to Savannah. Um, But uh, we'll still be covering the activities of the Republican convention as best we can, um, doing play-by-play as best we can of what's happening. David Schaefer and Scott Johnson of Cobb County are fighting it out for chairman of the party. When we come back, there's another scandal happening, and that is the David Ralston situation. Another another of Ralston's victims is coming forward, uh, and the mother of one of the victims is speaking out. I will talk to her here on WSB about the Ralston situation and the facts of that case. They're just terrible, sad situation. I'm here, I'm here, sorry, doing tech support for a friend. (laughs) Welcome, it is Eric Erickson here, Atlanta's Evening News. The phone number is 404-872-0750-1800, WSB Talk. As Republicans head to Savannah for their Republican convention to pick a new chairman this weekend in Savannah, we're continuing to highlight the issues plaguing the party, the things they're going to have to deal with down there and discuss. And one of those issues is David Ralston. More of the victims and families of victims involved in cases uh, where David Ralston represents a defendant uh, who has and has allowed the cases to drag out uh, are speaking out. One of those cases is the state of Georgia versus Jason Brothers. The case was opened on August 14th, 2013. Uh, it is. It looks like hopefully now this year going to trial. Uh, joining me to talk about that situation is Lori Wilson, whose uh, child was the victim. Lori, thank you very much for joining me. Hi. Now, could you walk us through um, what is, and we've got to use the the legal language here because the case hasn't gone to trial, the alleged language, but um, what you say happened to your child? Oh, God. Um, (laughs) Would you prefer me to, because I I have the briefing of, of what the charges are. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, um, to list the charges, um, I'll, I'll agree with them. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the indictment is one count each of rape and statutory rape, two counts yes, of aggravated child molestation, three mm-hmm. counts of child molestation, and three counts of simple assault. Yes, and sir. your daughter was under the age of 16 at the time of the alleged incident, correct? Yes, sir. And yes. now this case, it, it's still pending. It this occurred in 2013, and I, I believe I've got the the dates here. That uh, the the speaker is the the lawyer for the defendant, and had the case delayed August of 2014, September of 2014, March of 2015, October of 2016, February of 2017, March of 2018, and June of 2018. Yes, unfortunately, yes. And four of those were seven. Four of those were out of session. A couple of those, uh, February and March, for sure. Obviously, probably March 2015, March 2018, February 2017. The legislature would have been in session, um, right? But four of those out of session. This case just can't get wound up. No, it can't, and it's it's very sad because, I mean, it's sad for a lot of victims um, because he's just you know, delaying justice and delaying closure in a lot of cases. And um, it's it's completely illegal, immoral, um, irrational. 
uh, let me think if I can come up with any more I words to describe <laughs> what he's doing. Um, now, how old is he, your how old is your daughter now? She's twenty one, and she is every day my my blessing and my gift. And having to hold on to this and can't get closure. Yes, sir. And it's it's very difficult because, I mean, she has a lot of chronic health concerns. And um, if that wasn't hard enough to deal with, having this horrific thing happen to her and then have a bunch of people rally around the defendant and actually, you know, defend him and then... You know, he's got the Speaker of the House as his representation. So it's uh, it's just a big mess, <laughs> a now, big unfair mess. You, I know there are a, a lot of the metro area uh, members of the legislature and Republicans who are headed to Savannah listen to this program. You, you've got their ear right now. Uh, what do you want to tell them? Please. Please, please get this guy out of the house. Clean it up. Get him out. He is doing illegal things. He is harming people. He is hurting families. He is tearing people apart. And he knows it. I mean, somebody who spends their life as a career politician to defend scumbags, you know, slime balls, you know, people that we all just loathe and detest. And then he's the speaker of our house, and he's supposed to have conservative Christian values? I I don't think so. It's time to clean up. It's time to clean house. It's time to send him packing. And I I think he needs to be disbarred. Now, did you, have you participated in one of the bar complaints against the speaker? I will be, yes. Okay. All right. Um, Last question for you. Um, My understanding is that this is now finally scheduled for trial. Yes. Uh, When? I'm not getting excited. It's been scheduled for trial how many times now? Right. So, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not getting excited that this is going to be closure. I I don't I'm not the type of person at this point that is going to believe anything I'm being told. Well, Lori, look, uh, you'll definitely be in my prayers, and, and I really do mean that, and, and your daughter as well. And I'm sorry you're having to go through the situation, but I appreciate your courage in speaking out on this. Oh, I appreciate your your interviewing me, and um, you know, just I appreciate everybody who's willing to listen to reason that that this guy he, he knows what he's doing. He's known what he's been doing this whole time. And I don't think his, you know, attempts at, you know, justifying himself and where he's been and, you know, I don't think they're more important than the victims of right. these people, you know. I understand. Lori, thanks very much. I, I've got to leave it there, I'm afraid, but thank you very much for stopping by. So the case is supposed to uh, go to trial in June or July of this year, uh, but as Lori said, this has been delayed again. Here are the dates. August of 2014, September 2014, March of 2015, October 2016, February 2017, March of 2018, and June of 2018. Uh, Four of those times were out of session. Three of them were in session. Um, The speaker, he's he's not actually doing anything illegal by this. He, in 2008, if you'll recall, he sat on a committee that changed the law that allows the speaker to be able to claim any time that he's on legislative business. And continue to lay cases. And my understanding is that in this case, the defendant is is out, um, not in jail. Uh, I suspect this would be more quickly wrapped up if uh, he were incarcerated. But again, this is just it, it's it's a tragic situation. And you've got someone who was under the age of 16 at the time who's now over 20 and has to hang on to these memories And Republicans in our state house could solve this problem very quickly by removing the Speaker of the House from his position. And yet they're refusing to act. And when Republicans head to Savannah this weekend, they're going to need to have a conversation about what to do with the Speaker. You are out of your mind if you don't think 
the, the Democrats are going to turn this into a campaign issue next year. I mean, this is going to be the advertising campaign for the Democrats. You pick your state representative, Republican state representative, boilerplate mail pieces, boilerplate TV and radio ads. Why is Representative Blank defending David Ralston, denying these people justice? I mean, pick your state representative. There are 10 of them who have signed a resolution to remove David Ralston. The rest of them have defended him. Where where are they? Why aren't they standing up? They're going to have to answer for this. The question is, justice is going to come. The question is, does justice come from the Republicans ousting David Ralston as speaker, or does justice come from the Republicans or from the voters ousting the Republicans from their majority in the state house of representatives right before redistricting? Are the Republicans really willing to back David Ralston at the expense of their house majority? Because that's what this is ultimately going to come to. The trade war is heating up, but the White House is announcing late this evening they're holding off on imposing tariffs on auto purchases. Um, This is separate from the China issue. We'll get into these details when we come back, uh, along with the, um, well, the Green New Deal folks are losing their minds. But a a number of people called in and said, who who are the people who signed the resolution, the David Clark resolution, to oust Speaker Ralston? Well, we've got 10 brave souls in the House of Representatives who are willing to put their names on on a resolution to oust the Speaker. Now, the crazy thing is you, you need to understand that the moment they signed this sealed their fate. Sherry Gilligan is a state representative from Cumming, Georgia. She had legislation that would have designated a day as a Childhood Cancer Awareness Day. The speaker killed designating a day as Childhood Cancer Awareness because Sherry Gilligan was the sponsor. This is how petty and vindictive he is. This is why so many people wouldn't sign the legislation. Uh, But now they're out of session, so why won't they sign it? Uh, Here are the names of the people who have signed it. Uh, Michael Caldwell from Woodstock. David Clark is the author. He's from Buford. Kevin Cook from Carrollton. Sherry Gilligan from Cumming. Matt Gertler from Tiger. Jeff Jones from Brunswick. Colton Moore from Trenton. Ken Pullen from Zebulon. David Stover from Noonan. Scott Turner from Holly Springs. David Clark, Michael Caldwell, Kevin Cook, Sherry Gilligan, Matt Gertler, Jeff Jones, Colton Moore, Ken Pullen, David Stover, and Scott Turner. They're the ones who have been willing to put their name on a piece of paper as state representatives saying the speaker must go. No one else in the House of Representatives is willing to do it. The Democrats, I talked to one of the ranking Democrats who I've known for a while, and he told me that the reason they're not doing this is because they want it as a campaign issue. The speaker has blocked a number of pieces of legislation Democrats don't like, and they're thankful for him. And also next year, once the legislature reconvenes and is adjourned and they head into campaign season, they intend to light this on fire and they will take back the House. They need six seats and they will use this issue to take those seats back. The Republicans are standing with David Ralston because they're scared of him. The question is, should they be more scared of David Ralston or more scared of losing their House majority? Because they know it's coming. They know having the speaker and the scandal related and the victims coming forward and being in TV ads for Democrats is going to be an impressive thing to see. And it's going to hurt the Republicans. They're headed to Savannah this weekend. Will either of the, will, will Scott Johnson or uh, David Schaefer come out and call on the speaker to go? Will any of them stand up and make this case uh, as part of their campaign that, that if they want to preserve the majority for the Republicans, the speaker needs to go? Will either of them stand up and take that position? It's going to be interesting to see as we head to Savannah. When we come back, the trade war is heating up and Democratic fissures are breaking open all over the place. Well, we're just going to have to hold off on the trade war for a minute. We got some breaking news here. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson, Atlanta's evening news on WSB. Uh, Governor Brian Kipp has weighed in now 
on the Jim Beck situation. He is urging Jim Beck to resign uh, after Beck was charged with stealing $2 million from the Georgia Underwriters Association. Uh, in the letter to Beck, I'm reading now from the AJC, Greg Bluestein and Joshua Sharp just got this up. Uh, Kemp said the indictment, quote, severely undermines your ability to perform to fulfill your official obligations and notes he's got significant legal authority over the association he was accused of defrauding. Yeah. So the Georgia Underwriter Association essentially is you can almost think of it as a subsidiary of the uh, Georgia Insurance Commissioner's office. Here, here's what Kemp writes. In light of this connection and the possibility of new revelations, It would be highly inappropriate for you to continue to hold public office. I ask that you do what is right for our state and step down immediately. Beck pled not guilty earlier to the 38-count indictment, and the judge imposed a $25,000 bond and said that he can't uh, leave the state without permission, and he's banned from conducting business with the George Underwriter Association. Now, this is kind of a problem here because, again, um, the insurance commissioner plays a pretty significant role with the Georgia Underwriter Association. The insurance commissioner's office does at least. And if the judge has banned the insurance commissioner from conducting business with the George Underwriter Association, it becomes very difficult for him to be able to do his job. Now, Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan has also weighed in, uh, saying he was stunned with the level of sophistication. And uh, Scott Johnson, who is running for Georgia GOP chair, um, said he thinks that Beck needs to resign after reading the indictment. Um, Brian Kemp, in his letter, says he's very troubled and says he wants to be very thoughtful about the issue and make sure he's got all the facts. Well, that was his prior statement. Now he has out this letter from the governor saying that uh, Beck needs to go immediately. Uh, This sounds very much like uh, the governor will trigger a clause in state law that allows him to remove Beck from office if Beck will not go now. Uh, He cannot actually be removed from office because he's duly elected by the governor. Um, What the governor would have to do is convene a panel And the panel would decide whether or not he should be suspended based on whether or not he can do his job and whether or not the charges are related to his job. And I mean, they are in that the Georgia Underwriters Association is a connected directly to the insurance commissioner's office. So, of course, I think they would say he needs to be suspended and the governor then could suspend him. But in suspending him, he's not actually technically removed from office if this goes to trial. And he's found not guilty, he would resume his official duties. What the governor is saying right now is, given the nature of the charges, the indictments, and the evidence as presented, Beck needs to resign. Now, Beck is, in fairness, uh, Jim Beck is maintaining his innocence here. So let me give you the background on B.J. Pack. Uh, B.J. Pack, he's actually the first Korean-American legislator in uh, Georgia history. He was in the State House of Representatives from 2011-2017. And President Trump appointed him as the U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. He was confirmed by the Senate in September 2017. Uh, B.J. Pack was also at one point an assistant U.S. attorney. If you remember the case where people tried to steal Coke's trade secrets and sell them to Pepsi, B.J. Pack was the prosecutor who uh, prosecuted that case. He's he's a very straightforward, no nonsense guy. Uh, went to the University of Illinois at Sher- Champaign Urbana and uh, Stetson University. Got his BA at Stetson. Went to University of Illinois. Got his law degree there. Uh, highly respected. Uh, he was uh, he took Clay Cox's seat if you remember him in the state legislature. And then Buzz Brockway took BJ seat when he stepped aside. He didn't run again in 2016. And now President Trump has appointed him as the U.S. attorney. And he's a very straight-laced, very thorough guy. If you saw the indictment and you watched the press conference, this is a guy who dots all the I's and crosses all the T's. And they've got, if you read the indictment, they've clearly got people willing to testify about the transaction. They've clearly got private emails from a personal email account. And again, all of this is alleged All of this is innocent until proven guilty. Beck is allowed that. 
But you can read the indictment and see that these are significant, serious allegations. And the U.S. attorney has a paper trail. So Beck is allowed his day in court. He's allowed his defense. He is innocent until proven guilty. But you're starting to get public officials come out now, including the governor of the state of Georgia and the lieutenant governor of the state of Georgia and one of the candidates for party chairman coming out saying he needs to resign. This is going to cause problems. And you now have a judge who has ordered him uh, released on a $25,000 bond, but said in that uh, that he's not allowed to conduct business with the Georgia Underwriters Association, which if you're the insurance commissioner of the state of Georgia, because the Georgia Underwriters Association works so closely with that office, it's going to be very hard for him to conduct his job with this, which is why Brian Kemp is saying he needs to step aside. Um, the indictment, quote, severely undermines your ability to fulfill your obligations in light of the connection and the possibility connection between the Georgia Underwriters Association and the insurance commissioner's office and the possibility of new revelations. It would be highly inappropriate for you to continue to hold public office. I ask that you do is to write for our state and sit down immediately. That's Brian Kemp releasing that statement a very short time ago. The AJC and WSB had it first. Um, and this story is going to continue to play out. Now, we've had a lot of breaking news in the last 24, 48 hours. We need to discuss the trade war because there's breaking news on that front as well. And you, by the way, I, 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 I want to say something here because this is a pet peeve. I don't say breaking news lightly. I realize if you go to CNN or Fox News, every five minutes, it's a dong, breaking news. I, I try to rarely do the breaking news bit because I think it's so overplayed. There's a reason they do it psychologically. You're afraid you're going to miss something. And it turns out breaking news three weeks ago, the Avengers came out and, and yes, yeah, that's not breaking news. This is breaking news. The president and his trade team have decided to suspend tariffs that they were going to oppose. This is not the Chinese tariffs. This is separate tariffs. The president and his team had a legal deadline of Friday for Japan and Europe to deal with the United States in automotive tariffs. And the White House has decided late this afternoon, shortly after 5 p.m., that they're going to delay the imposition of those tariffs until later in the summer. The reason being is because they believe that the negotiations with Japan and Europe over automotive imports are actually going better than they expected. They don't want to impose the tariffs now with an artificial deadline when they're making progress in those talks. Now, the Chinese tariffs are another matter. You've got members of the Senate, members of the House, Republicans, in fact, coming out saying this isn't a, a good idea. But there's actually a surprise supporter for the president in his tariffs. Larry Lindsay, does that name ring a bell? Larry Lindsay was George W. Bush's economist in the White House. Wait till you hear what he has to say about the president's tariffs. Just a quick pause to give you a word about one of our great sponsors this week is Harry's Razors. Their founders were tired of paying up for razors that were overpriced and overdesigned. They know that shaving, you know that shaving doesn't require all the gimmicks like vibrating heads and flexible balls and handles that look like spaceships and things like that. Tactics the leading brands use just to raise prices. Harry's founders went out, they bought their own factory in Germany that makes world-class steel blades. You get a great shave for them. I've been a user of theirs for a long time. Really, I've been a user of Harry's for a long time. And right now, you can get a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave by going to harrys.com slash Eric. You'll be joining 10 million others who've tried Harry's. You'll get a weighted ergonomic handle, a five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, a travel blade cover, and listeners of my show can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash Eric. That's harrys.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. So go to harrys.com slash Eric, redeem your offer, let them know I said you help support the show, and you'll be getting a great shave in the process. You know, I tell my radio listeners as well, uh, as I'll tell you guys on the podcast, that I was always hesitant to use a five-blade razor because of razor burn, and I'm using Harry's five-blade razor, have been for a while now. They convinced me to switch from the three-blade to the five-blade, and it I don't get razor burn, so I like Harry's. You can go to harrys.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, today and get this great deal from Harry's. All right, folks. The phone number here is 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Also, if you need the show, 
because you need to listen again to explain to a friend why women aren't going to go to jail in Georgia for having abortions, or you want the interview of uh, the lady, the, the, the mother of the victim of one of Ralston's clients, text the word SHOW to 444-999. You can get the podcast. We do podcast the show. Text the word SHOW to 444-999. You can subscribe to the podcast, get the interview. We'll have it later this evening up on the series of tubes known as the Internet. So you can pass it around to your friends and say, see here, look, Eric's going to explain the law. Um, it, it, it's amazing to me that all of these people are out there screaming about the legislation. And, and you say, okay, cite me the provision. Well, somebody said something on the floor. Of the Senate. No, cite me. The, it doesn't matter what someone said on the floor of the House or Senate. Words on the floor of the House and Senate aren't legislation. Legislation is legislation. Show me the legislation. And they can't do it. They cannot do it. And so they're just screaming hysterically about it. Uh, they are very emotional. Now, the president and tariffs. Larry Lindsay is President Bush's chief economist uh, from his days in the White House. And Larry Lindsay has many, many harsh, critical things to say about President Trump, including that he asked two psychiatrists to review the president's behavior. And he's a 10 out of 10 narcissist, a total narcissist. The Chinese view the president as a narcissist. But... He said that he's in favor of the president's Chinese policy because, well, because he's such a narcissist, he can probably get a deal with the Chinese. And he said that the president's position vis-a-vis China is actually strong. The U.S. is in a better position than China because of our economy versus theirs. And it's important that we not back down now because China will otherwise run over us. Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. The phone number is 404-872-0750-1800 WSB Talk. I want to go to the phones to Daniel calling from Monroe. Welcome, Daniel. How are you? Good, Eric. I'm actually from Monroe, but I'm headed to Savannah for the convention. So oh, I thought I'd catch good you for you. I'm I'm jealous. I I kind of wanted to. I just wanted to go to Savannah. I didn't necessarily want to go to the convention. <laughs> well, I'll be I'll, I'll be your eyes and ears there. Excellent. <laughs> um, my question is, um, the, I know you. Uh, I had heard you talk about it earlier. The governor had sent Jim Beck a letter asking him to resign because he can ineffectively uh, not do his job because he's barred from having any business or any contact anything to do with the is it the gua um yeah okay uh, my question is should he resign as he has been asked to does the governor uh, automatically appoint someone and will they hold a special election because it doesn't make necessarily make sense to have some kind of special election for one statewide position that the turnout is going to be probably right. less than 10 percent or will they just wait and have it next year during an actual larger election year my understanding is actually that there isn't a special election um for this uh so the commissioner appoints a chief deputy insurance commissioner and in the event of vacancy of the commissioner uh, the chief deputy performs the duties of the commissioner now this has to be read in accordance with another state law that for the statewide offices, the governor can convene someone, remove them, and appoint someone else. So if if the insurance commissioner, my understanding from talking to a couple of people, and, and don't hold me to this one, please. Um, I haven't done all the research, like on the abortion law, going into the case law and stuff. I haven't, but I've talked to a couple of lawyers um, who have, and they tell me that if the insurance commissioner resigns or the governor removes him from office— then the chief deputy insurance commissioner takes over per statute, uh, OCGA 3324, uh, that in the event of the vacancy in the office of the insurance commissioner or in his absence or disability for any reason, the chief deputy shall perform all the duties of the commissioner. Now, um, what I have been told is that this is true except that if the um, provision is invoked by a, a panel that reviews the insurance commissioner and calls on the ouster of the insurance commissioner, then the governor gets to appoint someone. So the deputy insurance commissioner would stay until the governor appoints someone to take the role permanently. That person would not then be subject to a special election, but would stay in that position 
until the term expires, which would be four years. Um, the next general election, what, 2022. That is my – don't hold me to that. That is my understanding from talking to a couple of lawyers here, though, um, that that's the situation. Um, now, all of that being said, I want to switch to something else because I've been dying to talk about the story. And we don't have a lot of time left, and I I know that enough of you will appreciate this topic, even if you don't pay attention to this pop culture issue, uh, that we, we got to talk about it. Okay, yes, it's about Game of Thrones. Just just bear with me here. You may hate the show. You may never want to watch the show, but you will so appreciate this. So one of the main characters in the show who has been there since the first episode of the, se- of the first season is... Her character name is Daenerys Targaryen. She wants to be the queen. She wants to sit on the Iron Throne. She's called the Mother of Dragons. This is, if you've seen screenshots, she has the the white blonde hair. Um, She rides the dragon. Uh, No euphemisms intended. She actually rides a real dragon. And she wants to be the queen. Well, over eight seasons... Her father was this mad king who wanted to burn down the main city, the capital city called King's Landing. He was killed for wanting to burn down the city. He lost his mind. And over the over these eight seasons, you've seen her progressively turn more violent as, as her dragons grew. She uh, allowed her husband to pour molten gold over her brother's head to kill him in the first season. She crucified people. Uh, she she burned down a city. Uh, she wiped out the leaders of a city. She She fed people to drag. She led the dragons burn up people. Uh, She's wiped out navies. She's done all sorts of things, but she's been the hero for a lot of people. She became the mother of dragons. She was the hero for a lot of feminists. One of the things that the show did is in the sixth season through a series of events, basically all the male leaders were killed off and the women were put in charge And you had these feminist hot takes on social media that finally the women were in charge now. You had Sansa Stark in the north. You had Daenerys Targaryen coming. You had Cersei Lannister on the Iron Throne. This is is awesome. You got the women in charge. The women rule. Girl power. Except a funny thing happened in the story. The story had an echo of reality in it. You see, nothing got better with the women in charge. In fact, in some cases, things got worse. And Daenerys Targaryen, who has progressively shown herself to have a cruel streak um, in Sunday Night Show, uh, the people of King's Landing surrendered. They rang the bells to say, we surrender to you. And what did she do? She burned the city down. Mothers and children in the street burned alive by her dragons. And it has led to a meltdown among feminists that their heroine, committing genocide how dare these writers one woman actually said she has invested 11 years in this series only to see that it was actually a white male dream well George R. R. Martin of course is white and male but see the interesting thing here is that the, the show captures an aspect of reality here that just because women are in charge doesn't mean that it's going to get better You've got this mythology that has sprung up from feminism that, you know, if you just put the women in charge, it'll be the military holding the bake sales and the schools will be fully funded. How many times have you heard stuff like that? Well, it turns out in, in, in this re, this version of Game of Thrones, it's just as bad with the women. They're just as cruel. They're just as mean. They're just as terrible. They're just as crazy as the men. And people have lost their ever-living minds. And I got to applaud the writers here. I, this season of Game of Thrones does have some flaws. But the fact that they went there and everybody, people say, oh, I can't believe this is such a surprise. She would never do this. You've been seeing this progression for seven years of her increasing cruelty. And for people to act shocked and horrified by this, I mean, pay attention to what's going on around you. Uh, The world is not a fantasy. The world is not a fairy tale. And Game of Thrones is not a fairy tale. There is no happy ending in the story. Everyone should have known that going into it. The people who are emotionally invested in fiction and it doesn't go their way and they get upset with it, uh, there's something wrong with them, not anything wrong with the story. The story, if anything, is reflecting reality, that men and women both can be cruel. And this idea that somehow a women-led government would be a utopia has always been garbage, and now they've seen it on the screen. (laughs) 
I'm telling you again, I'm doing my bit for God and country. I, if you go to the resurgent.com, if you subscribe to the daily email, even you will, you can get my write up on Georgia's abortion law and how it, it's not going to throw women in jail. Unlike what the hysterics on the left are giving us, I've got the statutes, I've got the actual law, I've got the case law as well. I'm I'm linking to everything. I mean, you you can read the laws for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. And you can send it to your friends who would rather believe the lies and Alyssa Milano than actually believe the truth. All you have to do is text the word show to 444-999. And I'll ask for your email address. I'll subscribe to the show notes. I'll send you a podcast link. You can get the podcast. You can hear the interview with the, the victim's mom on the David Ralston situation. And that situation is going to continue to play out. We've got another victim this week uh, before the Republicans make it to Savannah uh, on this issue with David Ralston.